Hong is a postdoc from uh, this group in computer science at uh, Illinois. Uh, Hong Wei, probably you can share your screen. Yes, yeah, great. Yeah, you can start your talk. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hong Wei Wang, and I'm a I'm a postdoc from uh, Professor Henji and Professor Jia Wei Han's group. So today I'm going to present our work. Uh, chemical reaction aware molecule representation learning. And uh, this paper has been accepted by the uh, International Conference on Learning uh, Representations. Okay, so uh, how to represent molecules is a fundamental and crucial problem in chemistry. So let's take uh, the lactic acid as an example. So chemists usually use uh, IUPAC nomenclature, uh, the molecule formula and the structure formula to, uh, to, to represent molecules in chemistry literature. And uh, space uh, filling model and bow and stick model are also two common ways to represent molecules to, sh uh, to show their 3D structure. However, such representations are initially designed for uh, human readers rather than computers. So to facilitate machine learning algorithms, understanding and making use of molecules, molecule representation learning, uh, short for MR, uh, uh, the MRR is proposed to uh, map molecules into a low dimensional real space and represent them as dense vectors. And the learned vectors of molecules, also known as embeddings, can benefit a, a wide range of downstream tasks, such as uh, chemical reaction prediction, molecule property prediction, and so on. So uh, researchers uh, have proposed a great many uh, MRR methods. The, the first type of M, uh, MRR methods are called uh, small space methods. So to be self content, uh, so to be self content, uh, I will first briefly introduce uh, what SMALS is. So here uh, we we'll give two examples. So for the uh, lactic acid, its small strings can be written in this way, where we can see that uh, we use brackets to represent branch in SMALS. And for phenol, uh, its small strings can be uh, written in these two ways. So uh, since we need to use a string to to represent a ring. We break, uh, we, we break this ring at somewhere and then attach uh, two same numbers to the two endpoints of this ring, which means that uh, these two atoms are actually uh, connected. And uh, these two uh, strings of phenol is, is similar uh, and the difference uh, lies in uh, how to represent the benzene ring. The first mouse uh, used alternate single and double bonds to represent benzene ring while the, uh, while the second uh, SMALS use lowercase carbon atoms to, to indicate that this is a benzene ring. Uh, going back from SMALS, uh, let's see how, uh, how SMALS-based MIR methods work. So SMALS-based uh, SMALS MIR methods, uh, they take small strings as input and they use language models such as BERT and transformer as their base models. And they output the, the, the hidden layer as the model embeddings. So you can see this uh, SMALS transformer figure as an example. So this uh, SMALS transformer takes uh, the small strings as input, and they try to reconstruct this input string uh, using this decoder. And then uh, it uh, uses the, uh, the embedding from the hidden layer as the uh, molecule fingerprint. And it, it uses uh, this fingerprint uh, to predict the uh, target value. So the, exa uh, the examples uh, include uh, MoBert, Camberta, SMALS transformer, SMALS BERT, and molecule transformer. Uh, although these language models have great power of learning uh, representation of texts, they have difficulty uh, dealing with small strings because small strings is a 1D linear linearization of molecule structure which makes it hard uh, for language models to learn the original structure information of molecules uh, simply based on this, uh, the strings. So for example, uh, suppose we have a molecule whose structure and small strings are shown here. And we can see that uh, these two oxygen atoms, uh, they are close in these small strings, but actually they are far away from each other in, in, in its uh, original structure. So this will mislead the, this language models, which rely heavily on the uh, relative position of tokens to provide this uh, self-subversion signal. 
And another uh, line of MIR methods is that uh, use graph neural networks to process molecular graphs. So here uh, I will also briefly introduce what graph neural network is. So typically uh, GNNs follow a neighborhood uh, aggregation strategy. So suppose we have a graph and uh, we have a initial feature uh, XI for each node VI, and we use uh, HIK to, to uh, denote the, the hidden state of node VI in layer K. And then uh, a typical GNN will use this uh, uh, for loop to calculate the uh, embedding of each node. So for each, uh, so so first uh, the the node hidden states are initialized as their uh, initial feature, and then we repeat this uh, loop for k times. And for each uh, and and at each loop k for each node vi, we use an aggregate function to aggregate the neighborhood embedding for node i at previous layer, and we take this result as the uh, embedding for, for node i at this layer. And then uh, after uh, big k times, we return this h i k as the final embedding for each node vi. So the examples uh, for GN-based uh, MIR methods uh, include uh, westphalo Lemann network and message passing neural network. So to use GN to learn molecular embeddings, we first, uh, we repeat the aggregate function in GN for k times, which means that uh, we propagate messages over this graph for k times. So in each, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the case region, we aggregate neighborhood information and update the embedding for uh, atom i using this equation. And after big k iteration, we use a readout function to aggregate all atom embedding and return the, uh, the, the whole graph embedding using this readout function. So this uh, readout function can be like uh, summation or average or some uh, more, sophi more complicated uh, attention-based uh, function. So uh, is there any limitation on the existing uh, GM-based methods? The answer is yes. So also uh, GM-based methods are theoretically superior to SMALT-based methods in learning molecule structure. Uh, they are limited to uh, designing fresh and delicate GM architectures while ignoring the essence of MRR, which is the uh, generalization ability. So we will show that uh, there's no specific GN architecture that, that performs uh, universally best in all downstream tasks. So new GN architectures cannot essentially improve the performance of MRR, which inspires us to explore beyond uh, GN architectures. Now, uh, now I will introduce the, the design of our, of our model. So we use GNN as our uh, molecular encoder, and we uh, consider uh, four types of uh, initial features for each atom, which include uh, its element type, charge, and whether this atom is in, a, is in an aromatic ring and the count of attached uh, hydrogen atoms. And we do not consider edge feature, uh, which is bound type in this work, because a bound type can be inferred by the feature of its two, uh, of its two uh, endpoint atoms, and bound type does not uh, consistently improve the model performance. So uh, here we take this phenol as an example. So for this carbon in this phenol, uh, we have is, uh, four features here. So the element type is carbon and the charge is zero. And, and uh, this atom is in an aromatic ring. So, so it's true here. And the count of attached uh, hydrogen atoms is one. So we uh, so we transform these four features into their one-hot encoding, uh, which is this uh, vector here. So, so, so this vector uh, contains four parts and each part corresponds to one feature here. So this vector is a, a four-hot uh, vectors. Next, uh, we use GN to process molecule graphs. So taking, uh, uh, take this uh, proline molecule as example, in each iteration, we aggregate the neighborhood information for each atom. And finally, we use a readout function to obtain the uh, whole molecule embedding. So uh, as we uh, mentioned before, existing GNs uh, mainly focused on designing new uh, gene architectures, but ignore the essence of uh, the MRR, which is the generalization ability. 
So in this work, uh, we propose using chemical reaction to assist learning molecule embedding and improve the generalization ability. So uh, a chemical reaction defines a, a particular relation, this right arrow between a reactant set R and product set P. So uh, a chemical reaction usually uh, represents a closed system where several physical quantities of the system retain constant before and after the reaction, such as uh, mass, energy, and charge. So uh, it describes a certain kind of equivalence between its reactants and products in this uh, chemical reaction space. So our key idea is to preserve such equivalence in the molecule embedding space. Uh, that is, uh, we hope the sum of the reactant embeddings to be equal to the sum of product embeddings for a chemical reaction. So uh, let's see a simple example. So given the reaction of uh, alcohol oxidation here, we hope this uh, we hope this equation can still hold in the molecule embedding space, which means that uh, the embedding of acetal uh, here plus the embedding of oxygen here will equal to the embedding of uh, this as it tautal height. So this means that uh, we hope to preserve this equation uh, from this chemical uh, reaction space to the molecule embedding space. So we can show that uh, our proposed uh, constraint is able to improve the generalization ability of molecule embeddings. So to see this, we define we first uh, define the reaction center for um, uh, for chemical reaction. So the reaction center of a chemical reaction R to P is defined as the induced subgraph of reactants R in which each atom has at least one bond whose type uh, changes from R to P. So we take this uh, official ST verification uh, as an example. So we can see that uh, uh, here, the reaction center of this uh, reaction is these two uh, oxygen atoms because this because the uh, bond type of these two oxygen, uh, oxygen atoms changes from the uh, from R to P, right? So, so you can see here that this oxygen go from here, right? So we have uh, one carbon oxygen bond uh, broken, and this oxygen uh, goes from here to here. So we have a new uh, carbon oxygen uh, bond being created. So uh, while the other uh, other atoms they do not change, right? So, so we, so, so the uh, reaction center of this uh, reaction is these two um, oxygen atoms. Okay, so now comes our uh, proposition. So, uh, so suppose we uh, we have a chemical reaction R to P, where R is the reactant, uh, R is the reactant set, and P is the product set, and C is uh, C is its reaction center. And, and we suppose that uh, the, the layer of gn is big K and the real function is summation. And then uh, for, for an arbitrary atom A in one of the, reaction, uh, in one of the reactant whose final representation is HAK, the threshold term, which is the difference between the uh, product embeddings and uh, reactant embeddings is a function of this one if and only if the distance between this atom A and the reaction center C is less than K. So uh, we still, we, we take this uh, reaction as an example. So we can see that uh, the reaction center of this reaction is these two oxygen atoms and atoms uh, whose distance uh, to the reaction center is less than K is these uh, atoms colored in light orange, right? So our proposition, uh, says that the difference between the sum of the reactant embedding and the sum of product embedding is a function of this atom, uh, which are colored in this light orange and, and orange, because these, uh, because these atoms, uh, the, their distance to the uh, reaction center is less than three, right? So, so this uh, residual term uh, has nothing to do with the final uh, embedding of these two carbon atoms, right? Because they are, because their distance to this reaction center is, is, uh, is greater or equal to three, right? So, uh, so this 
proposition indicates that the rest of term between reaction, uh, be, between reactant embedding and product embeddings will fully and only depend on atoms that are less than k hops away from the reaction center. So, uh, so, so we can see that uh, suppose we, we use a three uh, layer GN to process this reaction, the, then the rest of the term between this one and this one uh, will totally depend on the, the reaction center colored in orange and the, and and atoms uh, whose distance from the reaction center is less uh, is one or, or two, which is colored in uh, light orange. So this implies that if our gene encoder has been uh, well optimized on this equation and output perfect embeddings, that is the embedding, uh, uh, the embeddings will make this equation hold, then we can replace these two carbon atoms with R1 and R2, right? And since this uh, rest of term does not depend on these two uh, parts. So, so, so we have, so, uh, so this means that if this equation hold, then this equation uh, will also hold for any, uh, for any functional group R1 and R2, right? So this induced uh, equation is called a uh, reaction template because uh, it, 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 it uh, abstracts a group of uh, chemical reactions within the same category. So, so this uh, learned reaction template is essential to improve the generalization ability of a model because the model can easily apply this knowledge to, to reactions which are unseen in training data, but comply with a non reaction template. So, okay, so uh, we now we come to the uh, training part. So straightforward uh, loss function for the proposed method is to minimize the, uh, is to minimize the difference between the sum of product, uh, product embeddings and sum of reacting embeddings for all reactions. But uh, this does not work because the model will learn to output all zero embeddings for all molecules. So, uh, so common solutions to, to, to this problem uh, are to introduce a negative sampling or a con contrastive learning uh, strategy. So here we use a mini batch based uh, contrastive learning framework since uh, it is more time and memory efficient. So for uh, for a mini batch uh, of data B, we first uh, use GN encoder to, to process all reactant R, I, and products P, I in this mini batch and get their uh, and get their embeddings, and and the uh, the matched pair R, I, P, I along this diagonal are treated as positive pairs whose embedding uh, difference will be minimized, while the unmatched pairs of the diagonal are treated as negative pairs whose embedding difference uh, will be maximized. So to, uh, to avoid the uh, total loss being dominated by these negative pairs, we use a margin-based uh, loss here. And here this gamma is a, is a positive uh, hyperparameter. Okay, so now we come to the uh, experiments. So we use uh, USPTO as our, our data set. So in this uh, USPTO data set, we have about uh, 400,000 uh, training reactions and, and about uh, 30,000 validation uh, reactions and, and 40,000 uh, test reactions. And each reaction contains small strings of up to five reactants and exactly one product. So we can see here uh, as an example. So uh, in, in this USPTO data set, we have multiple lines and each line corresponds to one chemical reaction. So we have uh, the reactant mouse here and we have product mouse here. So, he, so here we can see that uh, we have, so uh, normally we use dot to uh, separate uh, different reactants. So we can see here, we, we, we have uh, multiple reactants for each reaction and exactly one product. For each reaction. And uh, we formulate the task of chemical reaction prediction as a ranking problem. So in the inference uh, stage, given the uh, query reactant set R of a chemical reaction, we treat all products in the test set as a candidate pool C, and we, we use our trend model to process uh, all the uh, reactants and all the candidate products and then we can rank all the candidates based on the L2 distance between these reaction 
uh, between this rectal embeddings HR and candidate embeddings HC. And then we can, and then the, the ranking of all of the uh, ground truth product can be used to calculate uh, mean protocol rank, uh, the mean rank and uh, hit value uh, at one, three, five and 10. And for base science, we use uh, Motovac and Mobert as base science. So for each baseline, we use their, uh, their released uh, pre-trained model to output embeddings for molecules. Since uh, the, these two pre-trained models are not fine-tuned on, on this uh, USPTO data set, we propose uh, two fine-tuning strategies, uh, the Motovac uh, fine-tuned one and Mobert fine-tuned one, uh, which frees their model parameters but they train a diagonal matrix K to rank candidates. And we also uh, designed uh, this mobile fine tune two, which fine tunes this model parameter by minimizing the uh, contrast, uh, contrastive loss function on, on this USPTO data set. So note that uh, Motovac is not an end to end model, so uh, it cannot uh, use this uh, fine tune two strategy. So here is the result uh, of all methods in chemical reaction prediction. We can see that uh, the fine tune strategy uh, can, can indeed improve this uh, Motovac method. And, uh, and the same as the, uh, this mobile, right? But we can see that uh, this mobile, uh, mobile fine tune two is much better than this uh, mobile fine tune one because we, we fine tune uh, the the parameters of, of its model itself in this fine tune too. And here is the result of, of our proposed method uh, model. And we use uh, different genes as the molecular encoder. So it's clear that uh, all the four variants of molar significantly outperform this baselines, right? For example, the MRR improvement of molar tag over the best baseline, mobile fine tune two is, uh, uh, is uh, 40.2%. And uh, to test the, 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 uh, uh, to test our, uh, the performance of motor in, in real uh, scenarios, we collect, uh, for, uh, we collect uh, 16 multiple uh, choice questions on product prediction from online resources of uh, Oxford, Oxford University uh, Press, the uh, MH, practiceplus.com and GRE chemistry text uh, practice book. So each question gives the, uh, the reactions of a chemical reaction and asks to select the, the correct product out of uh, four or five choices. So these uh, multi-choice questions are quite difficult uh, even for chemists since the, uh, the candidates are, quite, uh, are usually quite similar to each other. So the result uh, is shown in this figure which indicates that uh, molar surpasses uh, base science by, by a large margin. So specifically, we can see that the uh, here at one, which is the uh, accuracy, uh, is uh, six to uh, two point five percent, which is twice as much as uh, as um, Motovac and and Mobert. And uh, we select the the uh, first uh, twenty reactions in the test set of. SPTO for case study. So this table shows the result of two uh, chemical reactions. So this column is the uh, reactions and this column is the uh, ground truth product. And this is the uh, predicted product by our method. And this is the uh, prediction of um, Mo2Vac. And this is the uh, prediction of uh, MoBert. So we can see that uh, the output of Mo2Vac and MoBert are already very similar to the ground truth, but our model is more powerful in predicting the precise answer, right? So specifically in, in this uh, number six reaction, the, uh, our method uh, successfully predict that this triangle ring breaks up while uh, Motovac and Mobert fail to do so. And in this uh, number 17 uh, reaction, there's a neutral group in, in this uh, reactant but it disappears after reaction. So our model predicts uh, this correct answer, but Motovac and Mobert 
they still retain this uh, neutral group in the in the product. Okay, so uh, due to time limit, uh, I will sk uh, sk skip this uh, molecule probability prediction part and this uh, graph added distance part. So, uh, so okay, so uh, so finally, uh, we show that the learned uh, molecule binding space. So we, we use the uh, pre-trained uh, model to output the embeddings of molecules in this BBBP dataset, and then we visualize them using a uh, TSNI. So in this figure, molecules are colored uh, according to the property of uh, permeability. So we find uh, two communities here of non-permeable molecules, which uh, demonstrate that uh, our method can capture this uh, molecule property of interest. And in, in this figure, uh, molecules are colored uh, according, uh, according to their uh, graph added distance to a randomly selected molecule, which is this one here. So uh, molecules uh, that, so, so, uh, so we can see that uh, these uh, molecules, which are colored in yellow, uh, so their, their distance to, 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 uh, to this molecule is less than uh, 30 and molecules are colored in red, uh, the distance to this molecule is more than 50. So we can see that uh, molecules that are similar to, to this molecule, which is colored in orange, are also close to it in this embedding space. While the molecules that are dissimilar to this molecule, which is colored in red, are also far from this, uh, from this point in, in this embedding space, right? So this result uh, shows that uh, our, mo uh, our model can capture th this uh, structural similarity between molecules. And in this figure, uh, mo molecules are colored uh, according to their size, which is the uh, number of uh, non-hydrogen atoms. So uh, it's clear that the, the embedding space uh, uh, is perfectly segmented into small molecule region, which is the upper part, and large molecule region, which is uh, the uh, lower part. So uh, in other words, the vertical axis of this 2D embedding space characterize the molecular size. So then an uh, interesting question is that, does the uh, horizontal axis have any physical meaning? So, so our answer is yes. And the result turn, uh, turns out to be very surprising. So we find that the, the, the horizontal axis are actually re uh, related to the, to the number of rings in a molecule. So uh, as shown in this figure, uh, no ring molecules, which are colored uh, in, in blue, are only in this uh, left cluster. And uh, one ring molecule, which, uh, which are colored uh, in, in yellow, are only in the uh, left and the, the middle clusters. And two ring molecule, which uh, is colored in orange, are only uh, are basically uh, in this middle cluster here, right? And, uh, and molecules, and this uh, right cluster mainly consists of molecules with more than, uh, more than two rings. So, uh, so this result is surprising in that uh, our model is actually not aware of any information related to the number of rings during training stage. So this means that our model can learn such structural information by itself and organize the embedding space in a very nice manner. Okay, so now we come to the uh, conclusion. So uh, we use genes as the molecule encoder and we use chemical reactions to assist the learning uh, molecular orientations. And, uh, and we hope that the, the sum of reacting embeddings and the sum of, uh, the, the sum of product embeddings are forced to be uh, equal in, in our model. And we prove that our model is able to learn reaction templates that are essential to improve the generalization ability. And, and our model is shown to benefit a, a wide range of downstream tasks, including uh, reaction prediction and property prediction and graph edit distance prediction. Uh, so that's all for my presentation. So uh, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to, to take any question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kongwei, for the uh, great talk. And yeah, anyone have any questions, you can come to the front. 
uh, or if uh, you have questions on Zoom, you can raise your hand and uh, we should be able to see it. Oh, you, you may need to use this one. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, this one's working now, right? Yeah. Great. So um, when you were describing the way you represented reactions, you talked about scrutinizing the local environment and bounding it to about three atoms, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, sorry? When you Running the a reaction, you bounded it to about three atoms around where the bond forming event was occurring. Uh, yeah. How well does this approach cope with creating, you know, significantly more complex molecules where you might imagine you take a linear molecule and you start folding it up via a cascade of reactions where there's more than one bond forming event occurring? Uh, can you just repeat your uh, question? So, uh, we, which part? Uh, so, so you mean? Well, does this approach capture when you try to perform a chemical reaction where you'll form multiple rings, for example, during the sequence of bond forming events? Or is it only capable of capturing a single bond forming event between a very simple system? Uh, you, you mean here, the, the, the yeah, yeah, exactly. When you were classifying this, you indicated uh -huh. it was you'd take a very small piece of the local environment at two locations. Yeah. Yes. What about, it, what about if the reaction itself is occurring at multiple different sites in a sequence? Uh, you mean here we have three uh, reactants, right? Well, here you have right. two things forming a bond, but what about if? Once they form that bond, it goes on to form another bond. Uh, can you make examples? So like uh, which like example, a polyene type cyclization, where you have a polyene saturated molecule and via various cascade, it could lead to a polycyclic molecule. Mm, so, so you mean that uh, we cannot have this reaction template for for that uh, reaction? That was basically my question. Does that template work for things where you would be forming more than one bond at a, like in a sequence? Uh, I think that uh, like, uh, so here, uh, so this is uh, like an example for, for this uh, pro proposition. So it actually means that uh, uh, like you need to carefully like uh, decide the, the number of K here. So if this K is like, so if your K is, is very small, uh, which means that uh, you may not able to cover this uh, reaction template, but if the K is uh, larger, which means that uh, you may you may include uh, much more unnecessary uh, items you know, for, for your reaction templates. Yeah, so I think the key is to stack uh, appropriate K here to, you know, to, to model your reaction template uh, as, as, pre uh, as precisely uh, as possible. So you're just saying if you expand K, then you can have greater coverage and more accurately capture a particular reaction? Uh, not necessarily, because uh, if this K is much larger, you may include uh, more unnecessary uh, items in your reaction template, right? Because uh, these items might not be necessary for, for, for this chemical reaction, but you include them. But, but uh, normally, when you include, uh, when you uh, increase the K, it will be better because it, it will cover more uh, items for your reaction. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I think uh, Michael, you raised hand on Zoom. Uh, yeah, please. thanks. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hi, it's Michael Polk. Um, my, my question is was similar. Um, so maybe I'll I'll try to um, 
ask it though in a slightly different way. Uh, if there mm -hmm. are, I guess, two uh, reaction centers, say, in your example here, in the reaction template, say these R1 and R2 somehow also form a bond. Um, does the model only account for one reaction center for each individual reactant? So you mean here the R1 and R2? Yeah, yeah just imagine that they're going to react as well. R1 and R2 will react and it will form some ring structure just for the case of, the, I don't know, this theoretical example. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, what yeah, we'll, we'll only will only one of these uh, reactions be uh, looked at essentially? Will it choose, say, one template versus the other? Will it choose either this oxygen uh, bond that you have highlighted, or will it, based off of the ranking, will it choose the R1, R2, or or can it? Uh, model both of them, say if this is actually the, the realistic situation? Yeah, I think uh, it is a good question. So actually this, uh, so this is an example of uh, fish ST verification. So in this example, we show that uh, um, a model can learn this type of uh, chemical reaction. But if there is an, uh, any other like chemical reaction between R1 and R2, the model like it will like it will also learn this uh, kind of reaction, but uh, it it should be uh, belong to another type of chemical reaction, right? So, so the model will like it will like go through all the training data and it, it will learn such uh, kind of chemical reaction based on this uh, based on this uh, training data. So, so the model will will learn uh, both uh, reaction templates, but uh, but from like from two different sides, yeah. So this got it. So to, maybe I can clarify. So at the end, um, in this scenario, it will choose based off of the ranking one of the one of the templates. So if it, it'll right. It... Uh, actually, this reaction template is not uh cannot be outputted by 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 a model. Uh, it's it's just uh, implicitly learned by a model. Yeah, so to get to the final product though, right? One of these is going to have to be ranked higher to actually produce the final product, either the R1, R2 reaction or the oxygen reaction. And so based off that, it will just select one of the reaction center reactions. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily one, because the model will like, it will rank all the 